Hello, Grody Odi Odio listeners, and thanks for tuning in to episode four, which we're going to start momentarily without me. I'm just, I had to be on this recording somewhere. So I'm, I'm jumping in here really quickly before we get to our conversation with Zach and Amanda Nauman to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Whoop. And that Whoop is a performance tool that is changing the way people track their fitness and optimize their training. That's right out there on the copy that they had me read. But I can tell you, as I have one on my wrist right now, and it was fascinating. Uh, the reason I'm not on this episode is I was in China. And then I came home from China, and I was in Colorado like 12 hours later. And boy, did that confuse the heck out of this whoop band. But it was able to keep right up with me and let me know that, uh, hey, buddy, haven't been sleeping a lot. You've been going through a lot of strain. Maybe you should take a day off. Maybe you're going to perform better if you get a little rest. And, and that's what I did and it, it actually helped a lot and it's a uh, great to be able to track all of my fitness gains through the whoop app on my phone and that's what you're paying for basically is that service of of that analysis and also of of that um the tracking and and the diagnostics that come from the wristband that they're going to send you at no extra cost so if you use the code C X H A I R S C X hairs at whoop.com, you will get 15% off either a 12 or 18 month subscription at whoop. Go check them out, whoop.com. Use the uh, offer code C X hairs. All right, Zach and Amanda, they're going to talk. I'm going to get out of the way. This is episode four of Grodio, and it is happening right now. Amanda, how are you? Hi, Zach. I'm good. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, to start off here, since I believe this is your first Grodio, uh, as we borrowed from the internet, <laughs> what, are, what are your thoughts on the, the term Grode? Oh, I cringe a little bit. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> when I first heard you guys use it, I was like, oh, I just, I know so many people in the Midwest that hate the word with like a passion. So I, I don't know. It's a love hate. I think it's clever and it works and it's fun. But at the same time, like it does make me cringe a little bit. <laughs> I was kind of with you, but, you know, Bill made the argument uh, and this comes back to something I was joshing you about before Dirty Con yes. says, right? We have we have these events that are really gravel where it's like 98 percent gravel. But then we have these other alternative racing events like Belgian Waffle that's, you know, got some dirt. It's got a decent amount of road. Um, and so, you know, you were, you were saying, oh, well, you know, Belgian waffles, not a, a gravel event. And then I found something you wrote like four years ago. Yeah, I know. I know. And, I, so. <laughs> and that's the thing. I was like, as soon as, as soon as you made that argument, I was like, I can't, I can't beat that. It's fine. Whatever. He wins. <laughs> Well, and so that's where Bill got me, right? Yeah, exactly. Is like, you know, because we're including Belgian waffle. We're including, like, uh, what are some other ones? I, I don't off the top of my head, but, you know, these other rides. Like, even the Crusher that just happened had a decent amount of road. Oh, so, yeah. you know, um, so that's what we're going with. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally on board. I think it, it's fun and it's clever and it's getting people's attention because, I mean, I also like alternative racing, but Grodio, I think, captures it a little bit more. Perfect. So this is your first Grodio, then. <laughs> it is <laughs> <sighs> uh, so to start uh, i've got quite a bit of ground that i'd like to cover um but for starters uh can we should we talk about you uh and what you've been up to you've been pretty busy yeah yeah i i didn't have a great cross season um that's for sure and so this whole year has kind of been jumping off of that crappy starting point and and seeing if I could pick up the pieces and put together a pretty good um gravel season if you want to call it that um but yeah I just I was battling some illness issues and just kept going backwards during cross season it was really frustrating so it was kind of nice to just hit the reset button in January and focus on you know land run Belgian waffle ride dirty Kanza, a lot of the big ones that I normally do um, and yeah, it was, it was fun to focus on something different and some different training. So I've been personally dealing with some illnesses this summer and mm -hmm. it's been terrible. Like I can't get any kind of fitness, you know, what was it like for you being a, you know, a professional cyclocrosser and dealing with that throughout last season? 
I was so frustrating. I hadn't gotten that many sinus infections in a row or gotten that sick to remember how debilitating it actually is. Um, because, you know, the optimist and the hard worker in me was like, no, it's fine. I can race through it. I can train through it. It's going to be okay. Like trying to convince myself it was going to be all right. And like nothing I did would make myself feel better about it because every race I tried to convince myself it was going to be okay and you can't you can't hide from an illness when it gets to that point and it just takes everything out of you just to recover from it so to think you can race at even 70 percent is laughable and that's kind of what I was hoping for and obviously just didn't happen um so yeah it was it was pretty disappointing um but at the same time like we also brought in Drew Dillman last year And it was a really big blessing in disguise that I didn't even foresee happening. Me having a terrible season, but being able to help him and see how well he can do. It was was really fun to actually take a step back from my own results and and help somebody else make sure he could get theirs and have the team be successful in that way. Um, So there was a bright light to it, but but yeah, it's been kind of a struggle to pick up from there for me personally. Yeah, that seems uh, the Drew being on your team seems to be going really well. And you talked him into doing uh, gravel uh, as well. So a little bit of your influence getting him getting him to start crushing some gravel. Yeah, yeah. A little reluctantly. But yeah, he caught on to some of the stuff he found enjoyable. Definitely not Dirty Kanza, but the rest of it he liked. Did he uh, did he have some words for you after that one or Yeah, I had some words for him because I came to the third checkpoint and he was sitting there. He was like sitting and he motioned to me like a finger across his neck like he was done. And I looked at him <laughs> I looked at him like dead in the face and I was like, Drew, you're finishing this and uh, grabbed a coke and I left because like I needed to focus on me, but I told I needed him to finish and he ended up like double leg cramping at mile one seventy five and he quit and I was really bummed but but yeah, I guess he he put himself in a pretty bad place. So I'm proud of him for at least trying. <laughs> yeah, it was cool to see, uh, you know, Gage didn't make it, but Lancey Pants and uh, Cade Bickmore uh, did as well. So it seems like the, the gravel influence is growing on our cycle crossers. They just, that's, that's good, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. I love that everybody's like gravel curious. <laughs> it's <laughs> is that awesome. what it's called? <laughs> yeah, that's what I call it. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's hilarious. Um, specifically for Dirty Kanza, I don't know, it was like your 17th time doing it, or so <laughs> it seems. Uh, I know I saw you early on and you were doing really well, but, uh, you know, based on what you were saying afterwards, you ended up having kind of a tough day yourself. Yeah, uh, how did, I did. How did DK go? Yeah, it was, um, I, man, I was thinking about it this morning. I like, after I wrote my race report, I really just tucked that race away. <laughs> Uh, So I haven't thought about it in a while, but yeah, I had a really good start and the day was going pretty good up until uh, like mile 45, 50, like whenever that first creek crossing was. Um, And yeah, I kind of just had really bad issues in the heat and it was something that had never really affected me before to the degree that it did this year. Um... And I got to the point where, like, I couldn't drink, I was feeling nauseous, and it was every, like, biomechanical problem that I didn't see coming uh, that I was just dealing with, and it turned into more of a mental day than a physical. Um, But yeah, I mean, it, it it wasn't a horrible experience. I still had a ton of fun and raced with a lot of people. It was just kind of hard, because everybody that was riding by me was like, are you okay? Like, what's wrong? Or... Uh, did something happen? Did you flat? I'm like, no, God damn it, stop asking me that question. I just feel like shit, okay? <laughs> and it was like, it was hard to admit that, but I mean, that's the place that I was in, and, and it was, I appreciated everybody asking me what was wrong and stuff, but that that was where I was at. Like, I just couldn't put the power out that I wanted to without feeling like I was going to vomit. And it was weird, because a lot of people got to that place, and, and talking to people even while I was riding, there was some guy that was like, Hey, I'm done. I gotta, I gotta vomit. And I'm like, okay, well, at least he feels the same way that I do. You know, it was just, yeah, it was a weird day, but, um, but it was tough. And like, I really commend everybody that suffered through that day just on the heat alone. Uh, cause it was a tough one. It, it's usually a mental game, but it, it was even more so that way this year. 
So I know we've all seen, uh, whether it be cross gravel or whatever, uh, athletes that are expected to do really, really well, and they just have a bad day. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like I look back at like Jay Powers when he had that really bad year at nationals, like that's all everyone talked about. Yeah. Um, that day. Uh, and I would say, you know, you might be the most well-known female gravel rider. Like everyone knows you, you're really friendly and people know who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, was that difficult <laughs> it, <laughs> having, yeah. you know, dealing with that, knowing that people actually like know who you are? Yeah, yeah, it was. And that's, that's why I say it. I was like so frustrated because I finished, I finished first twice and I finished second twice. So it's like nobody expected to see me as far back as I was at that first checkpoint. Um, and so people asking me were like legitimately concerned, like asking if I crashed or like had a flat or something. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, it was definitely frustrating, but at the same time, like I said, I appreciated that, that people were worried. Um, so yeah, it was fun, but it definitely, there was a lot of pressure and I, I still just tried to make the most of it and, and have a good time and make sure that you know, the people that I was riding with, I was, I was still trying to make sure I wasn't the grumpy one and making sure I was taking polls and keeping everybody else motivated. Cause ultimately that's what we're all there for is a good time. So the second I realized the result wasn't really there for me anymore, I just went back to the, mostly the reason why I signed up for these things in the first place was just to go out and have a good time and not worry about like pressure or results or anything like that. Has it been enjoyable for you becoming kind of like a mini celebrity at the Dirty Kanza? Uh, it, I mean, it is. And it's I'm sh like you even asking me that question to people who have never been there before. Like, seriously. But it's it's true. It, it Like when I get to that. You guys are. Town, you and Allison. Yeah. You and Allison Tetrick are like <laughs> mini celebrities in Emporia. Uh, yeah. It's so funny. And that's honestly the main like one of the reasons why I told my mom she needed to come this year. I was like, mom, there's like posters of me on Main Street. You don't understand. Because my parents did. <laughs> didn't like they never saw it so they didn't get it every time David would be like no she's like famous there they're like yeah whatever okay famous <laughs> but when she came this year she was like wow th this is like real <laughs> like I know I don't know what happened here but I'm like cool <laughs> well it's funny because I you know out on the course um, people were going by and I was with I forget who I was with just some person and they're like who are all these women and I'm like all right boom Amity Rockwell boom Allison Tetrick and she's like oh there's Amanda <laughs> like <laughs> Boom, Sarah Max. <laughs> Boom, Amy Charity. And it's like <laughs> the only one that they knew. Uh, and she's also, you know, it was also weird. She's like, you know who all these people are? And I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. You appear to know who Amanda is. Yeah, so that is clearly so she's doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's cool. I mean, I think, like I said, I, I grew up with that event too. So, you know, I showed up there when after Rebecca had won three times and then I showed up that mud year and just, I think, blew everybody's expectations out of the water because I think everybody expected Rebecca to win a fourth time. Um, and so people remember that mostly from even more so than just me winning twice. It was kind of like, oh yeah, that girl showed up and kind of changed things. So yeah, it's kind of nice to have that history with the event and it's part of the reason why I love it so much. And, you know, it was like I th the band was cool before everybody else thought it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to Dave Sheik before the race, he indicated, uh, you know, that you might want that third win. Is that something that still motivates you a little bit? Um, it, it, I definitely thought it was possible this year, um, and I, I definitely wanted it. But I think I might be like 350 curious for next year. So now that I've gotten five and I've gotten the, um, the gravel grail, I need to set that 200 aside for a little bit because it is totally a different animal training wise and takes a lot of focus between February through May. Um, so yeah, you're, you're hearing it from me first that I, I probably won't do the 200 next year. Um, and I'm considering the 350. So you're considering the 350, but you're going to go, which means, so if you're not doing the 200, like, I think it's inevitable that you're doing the DKXL then, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. You're convincing me right now. It's like 80% in my head. I have some people that, some friends in Emporia that are like, I want to do it. I'm like, okay, I'm th all right. I'm, I'm on the fence, but okay. So yeah, I'll, I might do it just for, just for the hell of it to see if I can. Cause that's, I mean, it's funny cause six years ago when David did his first 200 he came home and I was like I don't know if I can do 200 miles 
And the, that's kind of the fun part of signing up for that event is you sign up for it thinking like, I don't even know if I could finish this. And so putting myself in this position now, looking at the 350 is that same place I was in six years ago. And I think that's really cool because it's the reason why I signed up for Dirty Cans in the first place was that element of the unknown. And so looking at the 350 in that same way, I'm like, I don't even know if I could do that. So it's kind of tempting. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. well, it'll be, that'll be fun to see. Uh, and cool to see that you're doing that. Uh, it's always fun to see <laughs> as a, I go as a journalist, and I drive around in my air conditioned car, but to see people pushing themselves and taking on the new challenges, I think is really inspiring. Yeah. And I imagine that's the same for you. What keeps bringing you back to gravel? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's always been that. And that's, that's, I think the reason why I love it so much was because, you know, I was just getting bored of doing my own training before cross season. Cause that was my main focus. And I wanted to race mountain bikes and, when the Belgian waffle ride came up, like that first year that I did it, 120 miles or something was the longest ride I'd ever done. And like, that was the thing that hooked me was Belgian waffle ride and rock cobbler. Cause those are two pretty local events. Uh, and those are the two events that like kind of spawned everything for me. Cause I was like, these are really fun and I need to be doing this long stuff at this time of the year anyways. And, um, as those events became popular, you know, more people start looking for those same things around the country. And, and I think that's part of why it grew so quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, moving on a little bit from dirty Kanza, you got a chance for some redemption though. Uh, how excited were you knowing that Michigan coast to coast was like three weeks later? Oh yeah. 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 I was like, wait, what redemption? I thought I already got on the couch. <laughs> you were scaring me. <laughs> um, Gravel redemption. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure the couch was lovely, though. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, it was nice knowing when I got home, I was like, okay, sights are set on, you know, I needed to go hard for another 200 miles and prove to myself that the work that I had put in this spring was actually worth something because I just, I could never even go as hard as I wanted to at Dirty Kansas because my body just wouldn't let me. It was like, no, you're going to overheat. We're done. And it was so frustrating because I just wanted to give that all-out effort. And I came home knowing that I just didn't. And so it was nice to go to Michigan with that second opportunity to just leave it all out there in much much cooler temp, Not like so much cooler. It was still really humid. Um, but just at least have a clean slate and be able to start over and say, okay, how am I going to do a couple things differently? And yeah, have a, have a second chance to just go really hard. It sounds crazy to say like I needed another chance to do 200 miles, but, uh, yeah, I did. And it was nice. And it was a, it's a really awesome event. Your time was super impressive and I'm guessing your riding was as well. You know, what was that event like? And you know, how were you feeling on that day? Uh, yeah, it's a really cool event. I would, I really encourage people to sign up for it because it has that same feel of Dirty Kansas six years ago, very small grassroots, mostly local. Um, it's a lot flatter, so the elevation change isn't huge at that event. And so the first 50 miles of it before you get to the first checkpoint are pancake flat. Like there's one hill and it's like an overpass on a highway. And so coming into the first checkpoint, you're probably still with a group of like 100 plus riders. It's like massive. Um, but it's a lot of fun because you're not going balls to the wall like you are for the like in the first segment of Dirty Kanza. So in that sense, it's fun because the race starts at mile 51, essentially, as soon as everybody gets through the first checkpoint. Um, so I had a couple of friends that came for the first time this year and I was telling them like, don't worry, don't try to go hard, don't try to attack. Like, it's such a big group that nothing's going to get away in that first segment because it is completely flat. Like, nothing is separating efforts, and nobody wants to go hard that early. Um, so, yeah, it's a totally different animal in terms of strategy and, and how you tackle the day, but it goes into some beautiful forest, you know, two-track jeep trails and sand and yeah it's just awesome especially if you're a cross racer everybody that races cross that went to that event like there were a ton of midwest evo guys um and people from ohio and everybody that i saw there that races cross was like this event is rad i'm like i know tell more people <laughs> so yeah <laughs> it's a good it's a good one for cross racers to do i think in june i think it was interesting seeing you take on another 200 mile race you know three weeks after dk and uh, lance haydat won u23 nats that weekend and then i think alex howes the next weekend yeah. won pro road yeah. nats. 
you know, what are your thoughts on how, you know, uh, or how do you prepare for DK without having it wreck you? Because it's wrecked some people. It certainly will wreck people's seasons, uh, uh, it seems like. Yeah, for sure. I, I think uh, that's a tough question because I think a lot of it has to do with what you've done before it, you know. And so a lot of those guys have huge training volumes already and so dirty cans is kind of like a really nice training stress stress score for them that isn't surprisingly it's not like super massive compared to other people's training loads so for them it's just like a really nice bump and i do think it helped them and it helps a lot of people whose training volume is already high it's not something that's super debilitating but for like normal average everyday working people that train maybe 10 to 12 hours a week you know not 15 to 20 Um, it's definitely something that can sting for a while and have some time to recover from it. So on that flip side, the people who already have huge training volume, it ends up being a really good fitness bump for them. Um, so Lance, Alex, I think it actually helped them quite a bit in some of their later summer goals that they had. Uh, yeah, it was really cool to see Lance just break away and win that event. I was so stoked. (laughs) (laughs) I'm supposed to be neutral, but I was also excited. I know, for Lance I know, because he's a he's a really nice guy. He is. Lance is a really nice dude. He is. Yeah, I talked to him right before the day before Dirty Kansas. And I was like, "So you're doing this, huh?" And he's like, "Yeah, it's last minute decision. I'm kind of nervous." I'm like, "Don't worry, you're gonna be fine." And then he really <laughs> surprised me with how how well he stuck with it. So honestly, I was surprised, but not surprised that he did that well at nationals because I knew he just kind of has that extra something that is really impressive. Yeah. Um, speaking of, you know, Alex Howes, Lance, you know, the big discussion this year was the the World Tour guys coming in. Mm-hmm. What did what did you think, you know, as the as a dirty Kansa historian who's done it over the years? You know, what did you think about this year's race and the vibe and how things went out played out? Uh, it was it was really interesting. And I think a lot uh, there was a lot of hesitation, obviously, from them coming in. Um, and a lot of people immediately saying like, oh, great, you know, they've sold out. It's just the big guns that are going to come now. And, and like, truthfully, the promoters and the event really don't care that much about the front of the race. It's what gets the most attention. But those guys love the everyday man and the, the people who finish anywhere in between 20 through 2000. So... It was good and bad. It's really great press for the event, and it's definitely going to make a lot more people want to sign up for it next year. You know, the same kind of pathway that it's had the past six years. As soon as a few good people show up, a few more good people show up the following year. So I think this was the year that a lot of it changed. Um, I thought it was going to play out much differently from EF standpoint, I thought it was going to be more of a road race and they were going to have more an advantage racing as a team. Um, but, you know, Dirty Cans have proved me wrong with all of their elements being thrown at them and completely shaking up that race a lot differently than I think everybody expected on the men's side. Um, so, yeah, it's still, while I was very pessimistic and thinking, like, oh, great, it's going to turn into a road race now. Dirty Cans have proved me wrong and was like, well, no, we're still like a really tough race and we're just going to still blow this up no matter what. So it was really cool because I think it changed my mind on how no matter how many teams show up or people who want to work together, like it's still just going to be anybody's anybody's win because there's just so many different variables that can happen over 10 plus hours. I was talking to someone and you know we were talking about teams in gravel and stuff and my my takeaway from this season was that I think for the shorter distances, especially for like your metric centuries, mm-hmm. it seems like they matter more. Uh, but when you get to like 100, 150, 200 or like land run where there was that one section that kind of splintered the front. Yeah, uh, it seems it seems like teams, as you're saying, might let matter less. Yeah. Uh, you know, because there was that dude who went solo off the front from the start of the the 200 mm-hmm. and he didn't he didn't really last very long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or like I mean, yeah, it was just Colin Strickland going for it and being in a position that nobody thought that he would be a threat was just like I mean, nobody could have even written that or guessed that that was going to happen. Like it was just it was so cool that it reminded me that really anything can happen at these events and also reminded me that I got really lucky the past 4 years cuz anything could have happened then. And I just, I really did luck out for the past four previous years in how the event played out for me. And I think 
it's just pretty awesome. And I think part of the reason why I get so excited that week leading up to the event, because it's like anything can happen. It, it's There's no, you know, you can put your list of like hopefuls or podium picks or whatever. And, and ultimately it's probably going to be completely wrong because because anything can happen (laughs) so yeah it was awesome to see the world tour guys there they were super fun and it added a a really fun element at the front of the race at least for me for the first hour or so because it was like oh this is awesome and Lachlan's right next to me (laughs) but besides (laughs) that like yeah it was just it was fun (laughs) the only thing I will say is that that the podium stuff at the end it just all it did was it looked bad everybody that was there um it wasn't that big of a deal in person. Uh, the only issue, I think, was that Lifetime slash DK Promotions probably should have said something at the podium presentation. Because, I mean, I found out later that like they knew that nobody was showing up. And so I was frustrated because I was like, why didn't you guys say, oh, hey, you know, we know that they're not going to be here today. They're all flying home. It would have blown over much better if they had said that. Instead, they kind of just stood there like, oh, weird, nobody showed up. You're like, yeah, but you knew. You knew they weren't going to show up. That was my only frustration from the whole thing. Um, Besides that, it like in person, because I know you said you weren't there. It really wasn't that big of an issue in person. It's just Twitter making making something out of nothing. Yeah, I know. I'm a terrible person. I slept in, uh, and I did that the year before. Yeah, <laughs> you just, just like, you don't I'm care about the spirit it. of the event, Zach. I I don't. No, you're right. <laughs> like I after you know if uh, what 18 hour day or whatever, I was just like oh, I'm gonna sleep in. Yeah, this is at like 8 a.m. Yeah. But um, so I uh, my obs- curious your thoughts on this. Uh, you know, I think last year, like the pre and post race chatter. Uh, you know, I think both you and I live in a very online world. Mm-hmm. Uh, was pretty high. Uh, It didn't seem as high uh, to me this year, although there was a lot of attention on the race. What are your, what are your thoughts on, you know, kind of the, the media or people's commentary surrounding the DK this year? Uh, There wasn't, there wasn't anything to shit talk. I mean, excuse my language, but that that was, (laughs) yeah, no, (laughs) yeah, that was the case. And um, yeah, everything kind of played out very nicely and, the right people won and a lot of stuff happened to everybody out there on the road, but there wasn't any sort of drama. And so that wasn't something to talk about besides the podium, those guys missing. I think that was really the only thing that, um, people wanted to take issue with and freaking what's his kabush and the arrow bars besides that. Like it was mostly poking fun at those two things and nothing ever really that serious. So, um, yeah, it was nice that it was kind of just celebrating the event and most people, I think because of the drama in the past, it actually put more attention on the event. And so people just, you know, I think consumed the media and appreciated it. And I think uh, probably just more enjoyed it than they did want to say anything negative about it this year. Oh, that's a a good observation. So uh, it's kind of like the the generating controversy. Uh, So maybe like if we want people to really pay attention to Grodio, we should like start shit talking people in the middle of. (laughs) All right. We'll do that with the rankings. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. We'll get to those. That's next episode. Uh, You know, I don't want to give don't want to forget about the women. Uh, You know, the the world tour side with the men was Mm -hmm. obviously the story. But uh, to me going in, I'm super interested in following kind of what's going on with women's gravel racing. Mm And what I think is really interesting is you actually have like a group of like women gravel racers. Yeah. What's it like, you know, kind of racing against the same people and getting to know each other's strengths and stuff like that with, you know, there's like a core of you that are like legit gravel racers. Yeah. That we all kind of do the same events. Um, yeah, definitely. It's, it's kind of interesting how that happened. Uh, and more so on the women's side, like you're saying than the men's. And I am trying to rack my brain about why that is. And I'm, coming up with a reason like maybe on the road and mountain bike side there's just more contracts for the professionals that want to focus on that and so it kind of leaves some open doors for us to pick some different events that we want to do and find different sponsors that want to put us at those things I think maybe um yeah so it is it is interesting how there's like you know probably eight to ten of us that have done five of the same events in the same year um 
but yeah, it has been cool to see that evolution come up. And I know Amity said that that first time that she heard about Dirty Kanzo was when Yuri came home after 2015 and won, and it really sparked her interest on in doing some of these long adventure sort of events. And you know, I had done a ride with Allison the a couple months before she came to do Dirty Kanza th- that first year. Um, and she, she had talked to David on the ride and she was like, yeah, Yuri's trying to get me to do Dirty Kanza. And David's like, yeah, you should do it. Like you and Amanda can work together. And, and I remember him telling me that story later. I was like, why did you say that? She's going to like come and destroy me. And so she, and she ended up coming <laughs> and we had that sprint finish. And it's so funny how that played out that way. But it is, I think a lot of it was like we were all so inspired by our friends and people that we ride with that came home with these really cool stories. Um, and so it just kind of created this group of women that wanted to come and do these events. And, and it's been pretty cool to see that evolution happen. Do you think that, do you think that there will be either domestic or, you know, women or even world tour women's teams that eventually make their way because uh, we saw, like, Lauren Stevens is a domestic pro. Mm-hmm. Um, although I've seen her at more events with Matt not racing. So it was cool to see her jump in the 100 and crush it and then do really well at the Crusher. Yeah, yeah I saw that. Uh, as well. Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm curious. To sorry, there was a question in there first. <laughs> yeah, no, about the... Yeah, I'm curious to see if... Because, you know, EF... Uh, I don't really know if Trek, like, wanted Stetton to do this stuff where it was kind of his own personal vendetta. But... If that, if sponsors start to see that value, I can definitely see some, the level of talent continue to rise. Um, I mean, even Becca doing that Oregon stage race, I thought was so cool because she doesn't normally do or travel to some of those like longer uh, gravel events. And even that one was like a stage race, which is pretty awesome. So I do think it's great to see people from other disciplines want to come and do it, you know, more pros and stuff. And um, I think it's great for the industry and great for where we are right now as like a cycling community because we want the industry to do well and continue to come to these events. And if that's selling more product and different, you know, sorts of events and people signing up to do this stuff, it's good for everyone. So I think that you're pretty good at doing this, um, but, you know, gravel races take place in the middle of nowhere. Not much coverage for a lot of them. You know, how do you find ways to provide value for your sponsors via these events? Um, that's a good question. And it's funny because I remember the first time that I won when I came back after 2015, I remember sending emails out to sponsors and I talked to Bill about this, um, because I had a really great 2015-16 season after winning Dirty Kanza that first year of cross. And I used Dirty Kanza in like my sponsorship proposals to try and get more money for cross season because it was like I wasn't getting the cross results that I wanted and it's not like I was in a position where people were, were going to give me more money for my cross racing. So I was like, well, maybe if I like tell people I won Dirty Kansas, it's going to mean something. And, you know, it didn't really mean that much. (laughs) And so looking back at those emails, I'm like, man, you know how much more value an email like that has now than it did (laughs) four years ago? (laughs) It's so crazy. But yeah, I mean, it's it's providing value in a completely different way. And like over the past five years, my sponsors have definitely realized that. Um, I've gained some uh, who found more value in some of the things that I was doing. So I think that's a big part of the reason why some of these events are growing uh, at the pointy end of the race is because there are sponsors that see the value in, you know, the glamour and the grit and the, the photo and video content that comes from it, honestly, is just, it's, it's cool to see. And a lot of people like that stuff will click on it. Uh, It's interesting because it kind of plays towards that unknown factor for most everyday people that want to do cool stuff. Um, so it's nice to see sponsors, especially like Muscle Monster for me, they have been with me from the beginning, but as, as I got more involved in some of these longer sorts of events, they've grown with me. And so like, okay, we see the value in this. We're going to give you more because we want to see you do well at these things. And so that's been nice for me because I'm providing something to them that they didn't even know was there. And I think that that's you know, like with Tetric and Specialized and Rebecca and Niner and these companies that saw these athletes doing different stuff and gave them more for it, I think is really cool. 
Um, and so that's where we're at right now, like why Stetna is going to do this Belgian waffle ride stuff and things that are totally outside of his norm is because somebody who wants to invest in him is saying there's, there's value there. And so my sponsors are saying the same thing. And, um, yeah, so it's been interesting to see that relationship grow, I guess, over the past six, seven years. Last year after Dirty Conza, one of my favorite internet uh, comments was that <laughs> the media are ruining gravel by yeah, covering it. Yeah. Uh, do you think that? Do you think that more coverage? You know that it's getting more eyes. Do you think that's good? A good thing? Yeah, absolutely. Your um, April Fool's article about like <laughs> CBS or whatever going to do the the live streaming of it is going to be on TV. I I don't ever think I told you this, but I fully believed it for like twenty four hours. Because because David gets like your like the text message updates from Twitter and so he opened his phone and was like, oh my god, CBS is gonna gonna live stream and put it on TV, Dirty Kids this year and I was like, oh my god. So I, I seriously spent like a full twenty four hours like having anxiety but not looking at social media. So I didn't realize until like somebody messaged me later like, how funny was this? I'm like, what do you mean funny? This isn't funny. This is like serious. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, my God, it's an April Fool's joke. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it, it is it's good that that the media is giving attention to these sorts of events. I do still think that Dirty Kanza has the most amount of eyeballs um, and that might change, you know, in the, in the next decade or so as some of these events get bigger and. Um, you know, as Lifetime got Dirty Kanza, I, I could see something happening in the future where more of a, not necessarily series, but like an established route of events that people do from January through August might start to become more uh, refined, maybe. You know, it's kind of already there right now, like you said, more so on the women's side. I think there's like a core group of women that keep following the same events. The men are a little bit more spread out. Um, but who knows? I mean, I think when Leadville became the kind of event that people needed to sign up into a lottery for, they ended up having like qualifying events and that sort of thing. So I could see something like that happening in the future where there become events that not necessarily qualify you for Dirty Kansas, but maybe give you a better chance of racing it, let's say, if that could be something that happens in the future. Um, but it, yeah, it's in an interesting place right now where a ton of different things could happen. Um, but it is nice to see that the media is paying attention to it for sure. Oh, it's funny you mentioned the, the April Fool's joke. Uh, I thought everyone would read it and kind of get it when I said that it was going to be a 24 hour straight live. Mm -hmm, I know. <laughs> But I guess that was like a little too subtle. Yeah. Um, but it's funny. I, I was I was like sitting there and I get a Facebook message from Jim Cummins and he's like, Zach, we've been getting so many calls about your <laughs> April Fool's article. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm so sorry, man. Like, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Like, I didn't think anyone would read this. I thought it was a terrible <laughs> article. He's like, no, we love it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, thank God. Yeah. I thought he was going to like revoke my media pass yeah. and be like, we don't think you should come this year because we hate you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I was at camp. I was at their Dirty Kansas training camp, which is awesome, by the way. And Jim comes up to me during dinner one night. He's like, so I got, an, I got a message from Zach Schuster. He had like a cease and desist on that article. And he's seriously, he's like crying. He was laughing so hard. It was so funny. He just like couldn't believe that that actually happened. <laughs> It is true. We had to take it down. We got yeah. a cease and desist yeah. from CBS Sports, That's so, so that funny. was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> so that is that is amazing because they probably got so many messages that you don't even know about. Well, I think that's what happened. Mm -hmm. It probably wouldn't have been on their radar. They're like, "What? What's a gravel race?" Yeah. Although, like, they did a really cool broadcast from Iceman last year. Like, oh. it was really neat. Oh. You know, they did from Iceman Cometh in Michigan, and so you know, I think there's a path there. Uh, and I think there is a path to have coverage of DK, and I, I'm guessing it will happen. I think so. I mean, the the one, like, real complaint I heard on the road at Dirty Kanza last year, like, while we were racing, was how much dust in different, like, photo, video, media cars that were around. <clears throat> and I think part of that was, like, the Sven and Jens Voigt uh, media train that kind of followed them around for Trek. Which, you know, was, I, I expected that, but I think that that was the only real complaint from the riders was 
like, hey, can we just like focus on this without having to worry about cars buzzing by us? So we'll see. I mean, I think that was my first reaction when I heard that CBS thing was like, how are they even going to do this? Like if, you know, if that was an actual thing that somebody was considering in the future, that is a an interesting take on it on like, how would we actually do it? So it, it's it could be something really interesting in the future. And, you know, honestly, I think they did a really good job of how they do it now. Like, Gravel Guru does a lot of, um, like, live streams to finish, and they have people out taking pictures and stuff, and they have done that for the past, as long as I've been doing the event. Um, and so they've always captured something live, whether it was the finish line or the start or something, so that's been cool. But um, besides that, I mean, it really is kind of boring because it's such a long day. Like, I don't know what else. <laughs> that was the point yeah. of the story yeah. is like, um, although seeing how many people were following along trying to make sense of the time splits, yeah. I think actually a lot of people would have watched. There were, I heard of a lot of people that were like frantically refreshing the live timing to try to figure out what was going on. Yeah. I so. mean, especially, especially on the women's side, like if you didn't know something happened to Olivia, you thought she was going to win because she should have, she, the based on, if you were only looking at timing stamps, she should have won, you know, like if all of a sudden she finishes fifth, you're like, wait, what the F happened? <laughs> and it would have been cool to know that story. <laughs> No, I was I was getting I was already preparing the questions I was yeah. going to ask her. Yeah. Like I thought she was going to win. Yeah. She was dialed and crushing it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, so I guess we'll I guess we'll see uh, what ends up happening um, before we leave. DK, let's do one more DK question. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what do you what do you see for the, for the future of the event? Do you think it's the kind of thing that should stay in Emporia? That there's room to grow? Uh, you know, would that affect? the event uh, and the vibe because i think i think emporia is a key part of of what makes dk special based on my twi- two experiences oh yeah for sure i don't know where that rumor started about it moving but even when i was there i heard somebody saying like oh well it's not gonna be here next year and i thought it was like at the podium ceremony or something um and i i I really truly think it was just somebody who was like let's try and start a rumor because (laughs) because i know the emporia people and there's like no way in hell they would let it leave emporia they're too married to that town for it to move anywhere and i know the argument is that they have a cap of um the amount of registrants that they can take but the thing is it doesn't have anything to do with Emporia's capacity it has everything to do with the checkpoint towns and how many cars can get into those towns and park and be able to get the the correct amount of support to the amount of people who are racing so it doesn't have anything to do with Emporia that's my like I don't know why that rumor started because it can still start and finish in Emporia no matter what it's just the ability to support at those uh, checkpoint towns that is the limiting factor and why they can only have 5,000 or whatever it is 2003 something <laughs> whatever it is yeah, yeah there's it was a, a lot of people yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but i yeah it's never i think emporia is half the magic of that event and why people who have never been are are very quick to criticize the event and not understand why it's so special and i think even you showing up last year and doing that um photo gallery that you did and kind of a tribute to emporia was a really nice example of how when you come for your first time you realize that that's the magic of the event and you know doing it and going through the experience and riding and making new friends is part of it as well but it's seeing how much that town loves and supports the event and makes you feel like you've always been a part of their family is a real reason why it's so special and it's going to be hard to replicate that in a lot of other places um And I think as these events get more and more popular, the ones who have town and family and support from their local community are going to be the ones that are successful because, you know, yeah, there are a ton of great gravel roads in America, but there are only so many good towns of, you know, people who want to come and support it and make sure it's successful and see it through and and be there (laughs) until three in the morning to cheer it on, so... Yeah, that's it's something definitely special. I agree with every word that you said. I yeah. agree with you 100. percent And I mean, it was hard. You know, last year, uh, you know, my boss was like, "You should go to Dirty Conza. We should cover it." And I was like, "Ah, okay, that's a long ass drive for me from Wisconsin." <laughs> yeah. But sure. You know, I had 
And I got there and I was like, holy shit. Yeah. This is the coolest thing ever. Like, this is, to me, it's just like everything I want bike racing and like cycling to be yes. the sense of community, the sense of excitement, the sense of like pushing yourself. And uh, I guess I spend too much time online, but there's just so much negativity, I think, uh, in some spaces surrounding the sport. Yeah. And you go there and you're just like, you feel so just like, it's so positive. Yes. Like, and so this year I was like, I cannot wait for DK. I'm so excited. Like, I can't wait to go back. And it, it lived up to every expectation that I had. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's, uh, it, that's part of the reason why I like listening to you and Bill talk about it, because he has never been. And so oh, it's yeah. <laughs> funny listening to him ask certain questions because I'm like, man, Bill just doesn't get it. Like, and like yeah. and no offense to him. You just, cause you've never been there. You just don't get it. And, the, and I think that's the hard thing to explain to someone is like, you just, you got to experience it. And that's why in that article that we, you asked me what like the bucket list event is for me for these gravel events. And I said, I think everybody needs to go to Emporia and do dirty cans at whatever level they want to at some point in the future, because because it's worth the hype, it's worth what everybody's talking about, it's worth meeting all the people that show up and do it. Like, I promise you, it's just something totally different. <laughs> I think that should be, uh, closing it, that should be their new slogan. DK, Dirty Kanza, it lives up to the hype. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You're we'll welcome, Leland, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See what Jim and Leland have to say. Yes. Uh, so, I, I don't know, after, you know, I was, I was just at Montana Cross Camp, uh, and going there, like my brain just kind of went to cyclocross mode. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh, cyclocross season is coming. Mm-hmm. I'm so excited. I'm imagining the same is true for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but gravel season's not done. And since this is Grodio, we still have uh, some events coming up. Are you are you racing again uh, in any of the ones coming up? I am not. I was considering doing some stuff in August, but I mean, honestly, the reason why I've never done stuff in August is because of cross seasons. I'm still, yeah, yeah, I'm still in that boat of like, I can't really commit to it unless there's some sort of like sponsorship commitment. Um, So this year I was considering going to Rebecca's Private Idaho for some stuff I was going to work on with Niner, but that didn't happen. So it's not going to happen this year. Um, But this was one of the first years that I was considering it. But yeah, I mean, it's still, there's a lot of fun stuff happening in August. Gravel Worlds, SBT, uh, Rebecca's Private Idaho's Labor Day weekend. Um, So yeah, there's still some good events coming up that it's not over yet. So we have a, I guess we have an interesting situation. On, I believe it's the, is it the third weekend? I think it's the third weekend in August. Mm-hmm. You have Gravel Worlds. They're in year 10. Uh, it started very grassrootsy, um, you know, and they've built their way up to being a race that people target. You know, yeah. Allison, Amity, and some other folks were there. Kai were, was there last year. Yeah. Uh, you have Steamboat on the same day, which is a brand new event, mm-hmm. um, but is attracting like everybody Mm -hmm. everybody's going to steamboat Mm -hmm. um you know do you think uh do you think there's a future for new events like that to kind of make a splash and establish themselves i'm kind of curious to see how this will go um i don't know how to say this politically correct but they'll go wherever the money is so yeah yeah that's kind of what's happening with that weekend this year um i got a phone call earlier this year or late last year or something about that event and I was like are you really picking the same weekend as gravel worlds and they're like oh yeah it's no big deal people will still come to our event I was like what I don't I don't get it what are you trying to do here so I'm really torn um on that debate between those two events and kind of what happened uh with that situation but I'm that's part of the reason why I just didn't want to do anything at all that weekend um because I didn't, it didn't seem fair to split the two different kinds of riders, groups, communities, and onto that, into those two different categories. Um, but it seemed like they were forcing that in kind of the two different groups, like very Midwest and then very California, Colorado. If you get my drift. So I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable picking or picking a side. So I was like, I just, I don't, I don't know. I would eventually really like to do Gravel Worlds. It's something I've always wanted to do, and I was um, going to do it this year if Niner had had a new bike done for me in time, but they didn't. So I will I will instead be going to that um, West Coast Cyclocross that points prestige. I don't know if you've heard about that. Um, I do. We have a story coming oh, nice. probably about when this podcast gets posted. Nice. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so, I haven't, yeah. I haven't a hundred percent committed to that yet, but after I made some decisions about, you know, going to neither of those other gravel events, I think I'm going to do that cross stuff instead and it, it'll be good, um, prep leading into the season anyway. So yeah, I think I'm going to do that and kind of give some love to the West coast. Yeah, I went to Gravel Worlds last year, and actually, I had signed up to do it this year, Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not going to be able to due to my myriad health issues. So maybe, can we make a deal to both do it next year? Can we we make that a goal? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Okay. All right, all right. (laughs) Yeah, because, wait, did you go last year? I I covered it. I didn't do it. Oh, I Um, thought you did that interview with Amity. Huh? Did you not do that interview with Amity? Uh, I did do an interview with Amity last year. Yeah, I thought it was, like, right after she finished Gravel Worlds. It was, yeah. Oh, so you were there? I was, yes. Oh, oh, okay. Yes. Got it. Uh, but covering it kind of like DK, I actually want to I want to ride it. Oh, um, it's really... I see what you're saying. Like, you actually want to ride it. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, I was going to, like, take my bike, and I was, like, going to put on a kit oh, and, like, get out there and I suffer see, with everybody instead of just being the, the jerk in his, his uh, car, <laughs> like, in the AC, being like, wow, this is really fun. Like, oh. But man, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> These I guys are 100. You meant like actually reporting on it or something, but yeah, no, yeah, you totally should write it. That'd be great. Well, well, you should too. I, I think I, well, let's make a deal. Okay. Like you're doing DKXL next year, which I just committed to making you do, and we're gonna do <laughs> Grapple Worlds. All right, you heard it here first, <laughs> Internet. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, t- I guess to me that whole that weekend is just kind of interesting because uh, I look at kind of what you know you talked about a gravel series i kind of look at the races that everyone shows up to and you know i think the competition in a way makes the events and so you know land run is obviously an event belgian waffle dirty kanza crusher you know and i mean steamboat is going to be an event this year like everyone's going you know so yeah. it's it's kind of an interesting but it's so interesting because of... there's no precedence that's what i'm so confused yeah. about is like how are you all going on a whim on this i just i don't i don't get that I don't get that part of it. Yeah. Well, there's even people like who don't do gravel who are doing it. Yeah. Like <laughs> we're just like we're doing this. So yeah. And um, and I, I have my be... own opinion on like prize money and stuff, and I don't think that there should be prize money at these events, and that's a big draw. So there's yeah, yeah there's that side of it. Well, I did get the email like Gravel World sold out, so I got to find someone to give my entry to. So Aww. they're doing just fine, and they're super fun. Yeah. Like it's. It's like Gravel Worlds is like so grassrootsy. It's just it, it's almost hilarious yeah. how grassrootsy it, and um, chill yeah. and like what you expect gravel to be. It is <laughs> exactly, and that's that's like what it's supposed to be. So that's yeah, that's why I appreciate that. Uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll finish up this this Grodio episode with actually talking about cross. Mm-hmm. Uh, when are when are you kicking off your season, and what does your what does your early cross season look like? Um, so I think. Because of all this late season development, I might actually go to Virginia. Um, that was still on the fence because if I had gone to Idaho, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But I might go to Virginia for sure, Rochester. Um, because I had such a crap season last year, I got bumped out of the top 16 or so American women that would have been selected for the American World Cups. So for the first time in a couple of years, I won't be doing the Jingle Cross in Iowa um, World Cup because I got bummed that far down, which I'm really bummed about. <laughs> but it's kind of like backtracking back to three years ago when um, the whole goal was, you know, getting points, trying to move back up. Um, and so it's interesting because that podcast that you did with Bill where you were talking about Bill was really frustrated, like, what are what are the pros doing? I don't get it. There's no series. What's the goal here? What are what is the end game? I was like, wait, that's me. Like that's that's ev- that's me. I don't I don't know what to do. Tell me, Bill. And he didn't even answer, have an answer for me. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of the boat that I'm in right now. Um, is because there's no World Cup stuff for me. I might try to go to Cogsida or um, some of those November World Cups that are happening, just because I I I want to try and have redemption at Cogsida because David and I went the year that it was canceled, um, and kind of go back to Europe to have a little bit more of that experience if we can. Um, and besides that, like it's really just going back to the goal of trying to get points. And um, yeah, I mean, to answer Bill's question of like, what is somebody like me trying to shoot for? that's the answer is just playing the game of getting points and I that conversation you guys had where 
Bill was like, well, you know, maybe everybody's like going to get on a forum and we're going to get all the really good people together at these events. And I was like, that is never going to happen, Bill. That's all I was thinking. <laughs> I was like, no way are we all going to be like, yeah, let's get everybody that's really good at these same events and make it really hard to get points. Like, no, dream scenario, but unless there's money, that's not happening. So what's going to happen is people are going to get spread out and the points are going to you know, come to people who want to travel and go to different places where that that can happen. And so a lot of the C2 points are going to get maxed out in different areas because we're just so low on C1s. But yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how it happens this season. Yeah, for folks who are cross-curious or cross-interested or cross-passionate, uh, Bill Scheichen at uh, Cycle Across Radio has done a number of good episodes about trying to make sense of the season uh, and, you know, what's going to be going on. Uh, I guess I, you know, I, I, I see, like, I kind of like the East Coast, West Coast miniseries, and then you guys get together at Cincy and mm-hmm. Pan Ams to kind of throw down, and I think that might be kind of what happens in a way. Yeah. Because uh, there's not that motivation without the C1s for all of the West Coast riders to travel cross country when there are events in like West Sac, um, Boulder, Texas, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So, yes, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, yeah, it'll be fun to kind of see where people end up. Um, I think it's like Jingle Cross Iowa happen and then it's like Arkansas and some other different places that people can get going. So as soon as the World Cups fizzle and then we look to the rest of the season and and those different blocks that people can kind of travel to. After last year, I realized how condensed the season feels now because of nationals being back in December that, you know, it's it's a very short time frame as as much on a calendar, it looks like there's a lot of weekends. It's like, it's really not that much time to try and recoup stuff. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how many people show up to that Arkansas race, knowing it's eventually a world's course, um, and where people choose to spend their travel money, I guess, to try and get points and stuff. Well, cool. Well, that is a, an episode or a, a conversation for a whole nother yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I guess we'll wrap things up. What did what did you think of your first rodeo? Oh, it was fun. I love talking about this stuff. I love listening to you and Bill talk about this stuff because it's like an expert and a noob who has no idea, <laughs> which is kind of where everybody's at in this category right now. It's either people who really understand it or people who know nothing about it and they're curious about it. So, um, yeah, it's fun. It's great. I mean, there's an interesting thing happened where – People who race cross wanted to do some of this longer stuff, and now I'm seeing a lot of gravel endurance people, everyday riders who are now cross curious. So that's an interesting Ooh, thing that's also well, that's happening. Cr- yeah. Excellent. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. So it's cool, and I think that this is the perfect crossover conversation to be having right now. So yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say, Bill, I think does a good job of playing the the curious new. Yeah. He does it very well. Like he's a good yeah. he's a good like instigator yeah. and a good kind of like uh, follow the leader kind of thing. Yes. So, um, <laughs> well, awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on this episode of Grodio. Mm-hmm. And I believe I think we're on the wide angle podium. I'm a little confused. This is my first time hosting a, a wide angle podium <laughs> show. Uh, so you can you can listen to all of uh, whether it be cyclocross radio. Uh, the slow ride podcast and all uh, the gravel lot and all the content the wonderful wide angle podium at wideanglepodium.com and you can also find it there on your favorite place to listen to podcasts so uh, i hope i did that okay yeah yeah, (laughs) we'll see what we'll see what bill has to say yeah you can let him do an outro all right cool well thanks much uh it's awesome to talk to you and let's have you back on sometime yeah sounds good thanks zach